In this video, we're going to talk about what Robbins refers to as content blocks. And there's kind of a long list of them, but as a general uh, rule of thumb, what you need to think of these uh, elements as is elements that wrap up major sections of a page or major segments might be a better way to put it because section is one of these elements. And they're used uh, semantically. They are used to enclose content that fits what they're called. So of course the header contains content that usually comes at the top of a page and a footer contains uh, elements that usually come at the bottom. Now these elements contain usually um, paragraphs possibly H1, H2, possibly nav. For example, the header element might contain a nav element. So we're going to talk about these in a little bit more detail. I wanted to mention that Robbins begins this part of her chapter by talking about the main element. And I'm actually not going to discuss that because I don't think it's really ready for prime time yet. It's not supported in IE11, it's not supported in Edge, and we don't have to use it, so I would say I'm not gonna use it. The other one I'm not going to talk about in this video, although it's a very similar element, is div. We're going to talk about div when we talk about classes and IDs in another video later. Div is very generic. It can be made to do anything you want it to do. So that makes it pretty different from these more specifically named elements, such as article and header. So let's look at a few examples of header, footer, and nav on real websites. So here we have the New York Times. And if I go into the top and I use my inspect uh, option in Chrome, um, my developer tools open up and I can see that, let's see. So if I hover over the header element down in the elements uh, part of Chrome developer tools, I can see that this whole blue area that you see at the top is contained in the header element in the New York Times HTML. And they also have a nav element. So if I hover over nav, this blue highlighted area now, that is what is in their nav element on their homepage. Let's scroll down to the bottom of the New York Times homepage and their footer area is actually this, this tiny little bar at the bottom. Well, see, they actually have a nav inside their footer, but here we go. Here, this blue highlighted area is their footer on their home page and probably on some of their other pages as well. So this is a typical footer, uh, this area marked in blue here. Now let's look at another well-known publication website vox.com and if we uh, look up in their presumed header area and we inspect yes, we'll find so if I uh, select the header element we see the area defined in blue shaded in blue at the top all those things are contained within their header and I bet they have a nav inside there also if we open it and look around and sure enough right there it is that blue area there is in their nav element. Let's see if they have a footer. And let's see, yep, sure enough. So that whole area is the footer of the Vox homepage. Now, one last example is I'm gonna look at an article page. So this is not their homepage. This is an article page at Mother Jones Magazine. And if I inspect this top area, we can see that there is a header on the top of the article. So there's a nameplate for, 
the magazine for the entire website above that. It's also inside a header element, as you can see. But below that, for the article itself, there is a second header element that contains the headline, a subheading, a byline, and a dateline, as well as some social media icons. And I believe there is a footer on this page that is not for just the article, but for the entire site. So we can try to see the whole footer there. And now the area highlighted in blue, all of that is part of the footer element on the bottom of their article page at Mother Jones Magazine. Here's an example page from Outside Magazine where they have placed three articles on one page. And I find that a little unusual, but it's an interesting example. So this first article is about protein. See, they have a kind of nice layout. The second one is about Costco. And the third article is about electrolytes. And then they have a footer at the bottom, a big footer. But I want to show you their uh, HTML. So let's open up the uh, developer tools. And even though, OK, they've got a really huge amount of attributes embedded in their article, but this is one article. And if we can scroll up, you'll see that that one ends. And then below the Costco article, is in fact another article. And if we scroll again past the end of the Costco article, here's the electrolytes, and that is another article. If I select the upper article, you see that is highlighted in blue, and the article below it about electrolytes, I can select that too. So they have enclosed each of these articles within an article element. And it's true their article element has quite a lot of extra stuff inside it. You'll often see this on large publication sites where their, uh, their templates are filled by programmatic code that pulls their articles out of a database. I also want to point out the way the W3C groups these kinds of elements together in their concept of structural and semantic HTML. Now the W3C is the global organization that develops protocols and guidelines for the web. So they're really the ultimate authority on web standards. So when we look at their list of the elements that they call sections, you see that what is included here is body, article, section, nav, aside, header and footer, as well as address. You don't see main here, and you don't see div here. Where you do see div and main, is over in a part that the W3C calls grouping content. And you see that in that list, they've included the P and the OL, right? The ordered list, the unordered list. So some things that we covered in a previous video and main and div are in here. So another reason I'm not covering those in this video. I wanna emphasize that this example is just one possibility of many, many ways that you could structure a document. So if there's not only one way, it depends on the content that you're putting into your document, okay? But I wanted to give you just some kind of overview what might be inside a header. So you might have the title of the entire website, and you might have a link back to the home page. And you might also have a set of navigation links that lead out to other pages. Then below the header, below the header, you may have an article set off as just an article. And that article may be so simple 
that it does not have a header or a footer. It just has H's and paragraphs inside it, nothing else, right? That's allowed, that's okay. It doesn't have to have any sections. In fact, this page has no sections at all. Finally, if we look at the footer, the footer can contain very, very little, like the one we saw on the New York Times website, or it may contain a ton of things like we saw on the Mother Jones site. So inside this footer, there's a paragraph and there's an address, and then there's also another paragraph below that. So let's talk about the address for just a moment. The role of the address, the purpose of the address is to give information about the author of the content that this address is inside. So I'm the author of the entire page and it's giving contact information because it's got a link to my homepage and a link to my Twitter account. An address does not have to have any mailing information, any kind of physical street address. And in fact, it usually does not. An address usually has web-based contact information such as an email address, um, a home page, a bio page, a Twitter address, and so on. All right, so we still need to speak about sections, articles, and asides. But it won't take that long to talk about these because these are quite flexible. And I want to talk about the section and the article together. One very, very, very important point is that any section or article element is expected to contain its own heading, an H1, an H2, or smaller. If you can't justify this container having its own heading, then don't make that container an article or a section. Another sort of crazy thing is a section may contain articles and an article may contain sections. Yes, this can be confusing, but also you're not ever required to use articles or sections. You can use either one without the other. You can use articles and no sections. You can use an article, no sections. You can use a section and no articles. So they're very, very flexible. Just make sure that you're not using too many things. As few containers as you need is always the best practice. As for the aside, an aside element has to be inside the element to which it is tangential. It's something you wouldn't necessarily have to read. And if it's tangential to the entire page, it could be inside the body but more likely the aside is going to be inside an article or inside a section. And it's going to be related to that and not the whole rest of the page. Finally, I think these two examples of layout may help you think about how the header, the footer, the articles, and the aside work together. So just two examples out of an infinite number of examples of how web apps and web pages can be laid out once we start using CSS two weeks from now. The aside can appear anywhere on the page. It could be inside a section. It could be inside an article. You don't need three of anything on a page. You don't even need one of any of these. You don't have to use any of these elements if they don't suit your content. I hope these content grouping or content block elements make a little more sense to you now. You will get more comfortable with them as you begin to use them.